Hey everybody, it's Debbie Davis. I had some requests to do a felony sentencing guideline tutorial. So basically in Michigan, if you're being sentenced to a felony crime and you've been convicted either by trial or by entering a plea of guilty or no contest, whatever the case may be, the court uses the sentencing guidelines to determine what your uh, suggested guideline range is. Now, these are not set in stone. It's an advisory guideline range, so the judge can go above, below, or right within the guideline range. But generally, it gives a pretty good idea of what it should be. All right, so I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully, this works okay. Switch it up a little bit to make me smaller and the screen bigger. So if you go online, anybody can do this for free. It's at the Michigan Judicial Institute website. So mjieducation.mi.gov. You will find so many wonderful resources here. So this is self, itself is the sentencing guideline manual. Let me go to contents here. So if you go through each of these, there's the general information which tells you how to do the scoring. So if you're an attorney, you really need to know how to do this. I can't tell you how many times we've had attorneys that say that they're not good at scoring guidelines or they don't know how to score the guidelines. It's really a disservice to your clients if you're not figuring out what the advisory guideline range might be for them. Because if they enter a plea not knowing what those guidelines are, they could end up with a mandatory prison sentence when they thought that they were maybe only going to get some sort of a local jail sentence. So looking at this, there's also the definitions. So you'll hear me talk about a cell, not like a a jail cell or a prison cell, a cell in a, a table. So the, the cell that we're looking at is the intersection of the offender's OV and their PRV, and that gives us their sentencing grid. Okay, if we're looking at, for example, uh, let's look at some different felonies. So all of these things listed are current through October of 2021. So this lists the MCL number, so the Code of Michigan uh, that says what the crime is under. So you can go by numerical list. So if you only know what the numeric uh, MCL code is, or you can go by alphabetical. So if we're looking at, say, none of these are that great. Let's scroll down a bit. What's a good one? Uh, let's see. How about arson in the fourth degree? Okay. So you look over here and arson in the fourth degree has a statutory maximum of five years. Looking at arson in the first degree, the maximum is life. So very different, obviously. What we're looking at over here in arson, you'll notice that the difference is one is a crime against a person and one is a crime against a property. One is a class A felony, which is one of the most serious, and the other is an E, which is kind of mid-range. So why these are important is when you go back to your table of contents here, if you're scoring the conviction for a crime against property versus a crime against a person, it's very different. Not all variables are used on every crime. So if we were looking at the fourth degree arson, we'll go up to crimes against property. Your PRV means your prior record variable. So what we're looking at there is any prior convictions, not just a charge, not something you were found not guilty of, but an actual conviction. And it's broken down into high severity felonies, low severity felonies, um, juvenile felonies, that sort of thing. So as we scroll down, if you look at an offender who has three prior high severity felonies, they're gonna be at 75 points. And it lists what those high severity felonies are. Anything that is M2, which is murder, or a class A, B, C, or D felony. All right. And then if we go down, you would score each of these PRVs. So there's PRV 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. What I usually do is just get a piece of notebook paper, honestly, and write down each PRV. And you go through the criminal history, assuming that you know the criminal history, uh, as best that they tell you. But uh, when you go through the criminal history, you're going to assess points for how many low severity and high severity felonies they have as adults. Then you're going to look at their prior record as juveniles, which is important. People kind of have this misconception that um, when you become an adult, your juvenile record is just wiped away. That's not always the case. If you get in trouble as an adult and you have a juvenile record, those are going to come back to haunt you. So if you have high severity juvenile crimes, um, again, A, B, C, D, murder, I thought you'd probably be looking at this if you were in a juvenile murder, murder conviction, but Anyway, whatever those might be. And sometimes it's a zero. So if people didn't get in trouble at all as a juvenile, they would have a zero points in PRV3. 
If we go down, PRV4, these are the low severity felony crimes as a juvenile. Again, scoring them depending on how many you have. Next is PRV5. This is misdemeanor conviction, and that's either a misdemeanor conviction as an adult or a prior misdemeanor adjudication as a juvenile. So again, we use the term adjudication as a juvenile because you don't get convicted necessarily. In Michigan, it used to be that once you turned 17, you were considered an adult for criminal purposes. Interesting because for contract purposes, like signing um, to, to rent your own place, you were not an adult until you were 18. That changed as of, I believe, October 1st, 2021. It switched to be now 18 and under. You are considered a juvenile. So you would go through the juvenile court system for any crimes unless you're waived to the adult court uh, by the prosecutor. So you'll, again, get points for any misdemeanors that you have. It maxes out at seven misdemeanors. So a lot of our people that come through, unfortunately, have way more than seven misdemeanors on their record during their lifetime. So those all count. Uh, something unique, though, is you don't count any crimes, convictions, adjudications, whatever it might be that have a 10-year break between the very last thing that happened in that case. So the last thing would be either the end of the jail sentence when you were let out and free or the end of the prison sentence or the end of your parole or the end of your probation or when you have paid off all of your fines and costs and restitution, which for some people is never. So they never get that 10-year break. But there are people that simply serve a jail sentence for a misdemeanor back in the 1980s. If there's a 10-year break between when the last thing that occurred on that case was and their next crime, those fall off for scoring purposes. Scrolling down, PRV6 is your relationship to the criminal justice system. So remember, we're talking about this conviction that you are scoring. So arson in the fourth degree, whatever. If at the time you were incarcerated in jail awaiting sentencing or adjudication on a conviction or probation violation, you get points if you're in the prison or you're on parole or probation or delayed sentence, something like that, uh, whether it's a felony or misdemeanor, different point values, or a zero if you are not in the system at that time that the crime was committed. PRV7, this one's a little bit tricky. This is any concurrent or um, subsequent felony convictions. So a lot of times you'll see that we require somebody to plead to more than one felony count. And sometimes the reason that we do that is because if their PRV is at a zero because they haven't had any crimes in a 10-year period or they have none, and it's a fairly serious crime that we believe that they should have a higher grid number for in their cell, then we have them plead to more than one felony at the same time. So three counts on the complaint instead of only pleading to one count. So what that does is takes your PRV from a zero and bumps it up to a 20 or a 10 if you only have one that you're having them plead to. Next, we move down to the offense variables, the OVs. With an offense variable, this is specific only to the crime for which they are being sentenced. So if you're scoring the arson in the fourth degree, you're only talking about what happened with the arson crime. So with those Again, very specific. Was there a firearm? Was there a harmful biological substance? Was the, the victim touched by any weapon? And sometimes it's a zero on these. OV2 would be for lethal possession, uh, lethal potential of the weapon that is used. Again, pretty self-explanatory in some of these. OV3, the physical injury to a victim. So for example, if the arson included somebody that got hurt, like a firefighter got hurt or something like that, it could be um, scored. If it's life-threatening or permanent, obviously more points than no physical injury or a simple physical injury that didn't require medical treatment. Next is OV4, psychological injury to the victim. Again, sometimes there, this isn't scored, but generally you're looking at, did the victim have any psychological counseling uh, due to what occurred to them? OV9, number of victims, kind of self-explanatory. Uh, you get points for the number of victims that were put at risk of loss of property or at risk of physical harm. OV10, exploitation of a vulnerable victim. Again, what does that mean? The instructions on the right kind of tell you predatory conduct is pre-offense conduct, it's conduct that is directed at a victim or law enforcement officer posing as a potential victim for the primary purpose of victimization. And then exploit is to use a victim for your selfish or manipulative 
unethical purposes. So those are not always something that gets scored, but occasionally they do. OV-12, also a tricky one. So this is contemporaneous felonious criminal acts. However, it has to occur within 24 hours of the sentencing offense. Uh, and it has to not result in a conviction. So again, going back to that situation where you have more than one count that somebody is entering a plea to, you can't use that in OV-12. Continuing pattern of criminal behavior. This looks at a five-year period prior to the sentencing offense, and you get points for having uh, crimes against a person or crimes against um, a property or having it be uh, part of a gang ac activity or soliciting membership for gangs. So if that does exist, or there's, and, and this counts as the sentencing offense too. So if you have three counts of criminal sexual conduct, that's crime against a person, that will get you then the 25 points for the offense being part of that pattern. And again, it's in a five-year period, not that 24-hour period that you're looking at in OV-12. OV-14, the offender's role. If there's more than one offender, there can be a leader in this situation. There can be more than one leader too. Say that there's three people involved, there can be two leaders. It just kind of depends on the uh, nature of the offense and the facts of the particular case. OV-16, for an arson case, this is probably one of your bigger ones. This is the uh, value of the property that was lost. So, uh, you know, it, there's animals that are specified versus property or property that has a significant historical value or sentimental value, uh, all the way down to no property being lost uh, or damaged. Going down, OV-19, threat to security of a penal institution. This is more so if there is some sort of behavior, even while they're on bond, that uh, is interfering or attempting to interfere with the administration of justice. Sometimes if somebody absconds, they don't show up for court, uh, that can be counted as a 10-point interfering with the administration of justice by not showing up for court. OV-20 is terrorism. Thankfully, we don't see a lot of that here, but there is, of course, uh, points assessed if there is any act of terrorism. Now, once you score all of those, you add up your points for your PRV and you add up your points for your OV. Then we're going to go over to the contents and you're going to go down to the sentencing grids. So each of these grids are for the different severities of the crime. So it starts out with second degree murder, and then we have our class A, B, C, sorry if I'm scrolling too fast, D, and let's look at E because that was where the um, arson fourth is. If you look at across the top here, those are your prior record variable. So for example, if you've never been in trouble before, no, convi no convictions whatsoever, no concurrent convictions, it's one count that you're pleading to, you would be at a zero. So A, that's the best you can be. Looking at your points over here, this one going down the side is your offense variable. So remember, we're looking at were there weapons evolved, how many people were hurt, was there psychological injury, is there a pattern? All of those points get added up. So if you are between zero and nine points on that, you, the worst you're looking at is a zero to three months. And that little asterisk there means that it's an, an, um, a mandatory local sentence if you get jail at all. Now there is some discretion that's given to the judge as far as how much time they send a person to jail. But in general, anything that's like six months or under, you're looking at a fines and costs and maybe not even a probationary sentence, even though it's a felony, which is kind of crazy. The max is 75 points. So for example, if it was a pattern and you have all the points for it being a historical value of property, whatever it might be, if you get up to 75 points, now you're looking at zero to 17 months. Again, that 17 is kind of confusing because there's an asterisk next to it. it means that you're not going to be able to be sent to a prison because it's a mandatory intermediate sanction, which means local jail, not prison. If you look over here, you notice that these all have the asterisks on them, right? These that are shaded, are what we call straddle cells. So say you fall in a D3, you're a straddle cell of between 10 and 23 months. What that means is the judge advisory guidelines are between 10 and 23 months on the minimum end. Now remember, crime of arson, class E felony, the max is five years. So that's for a first offense if you don't have any prior felonies. So if you fall in that 10 to 23 months, if you're 12 months or below, you're in local jail. 
If it's over 12 months, then you have to go to the Michigan Department of Corrections or prison. If you go to prison, that's where you would be able to per, um, request to be paroled or apply for parole once you've completed your minimum. So say the judge gives you 14 months in the Michigan Department of Corrections. You can then apply to be let out on parole after the initial 14 months are served. If you don't get paroled that first time, they'll tell you basically why and what you need to do, and they'll flop you for either six months or a year, whatever it might be. They can only keep flopping you for up to that maximum amount, so five years. If they do that, you get out in five years, you're never on parole. If you do get paroled out, then you have a parole agent that's in your local area and kind of like a probation, you have to check in, drug test if they ask you to, alcohol test if they ask you to, get a job, go, go to classes, whatever it might be that your parole agent requires you to do. If you screw up and you get in trouble, they can sanction you. And it could be anything from just a warning to um, a local jail sentence to sending you back to prison. Looking at these ones down here in the bottom right-hand side, those that are a white cell with no asterisk are a mandatory prison sentence. So for example, if you're over here at the F and uh, F4, you're 19 to 38. Again, this is on the minimum, 19 to 38, but the maximum is then five years. So the judge will give you probably somewhere between that 19 and 38, uh, anything below 36 months and a couple other factors that then depending on the crime, you can ask for a special alternative incarceration, which used to be called boot camp. If you do get that and the judge, the local judge is sentenced to you, gets a letter from the DOC, and if they agree, then you could be put in that boot camp SAI program. You would then do a 90-day uh, program at the prison and then parole out well short of that 36 months. So anything up to 36 months, uh, you can ask for that SAI, again, depending on the type of crime and your history, that sort of thing. All right, these other letters here, HO2, HO3, and HO4. If you watched before our circuit court went off from streaming, you may have heard people talk about ha habitual offender notices. And I guess in uh, district court, you'll hear it too. Uh, sometimes it's what the, the offender is charged with. A habitual offender second means that they've been charged or they've been convicted of one prior felony and it doesn't have to be any particular felony and it can be in any state. So in Michigan, obviously we have all of our felonies listed, but if there's something in another state that is considered a felony in that state, uh, you can use it as a habitual offender notice. First habitual offender notice, you get one and a half times the, uh, the original sentence. So like for the arson, uh, it would be like seven and a half years. I don't do math in my head too good, sorry. But um, then habitual offender third offense notice means that you've had two priors. And then of course a fourth means that you've had three priors. Depending on the severity of your habitual offender notice, if the crime for which uh, you are being charged is an over a 15 year, I say 15 year, I should look at that. Uh, it can be up to life in prison for a fourth habitual offender. Also, there are certain crimes that are special. And if you have uh, one of these special crimes in your past, say like a CSC first degree, and you get charged with another CSC, it can be a 25 year mandatory minimum if you have um, the fourth habitual with those special offenses on it. So again, when I say 25 year mandatory minimum, it means that these grids don't matter anymore. It would be 25 years, no less, up to uh, whatever the maximum is. So with that, hopefully that gives you a little bit better of an idea of how sentencings are done in Michigan. Certainly there's a lot to it, but it's something that once you start doing it, it gets a lot easier. Uh, again, if you're a practicing attorney and you haven't done sentencing guidelines before, just give it a try. I mean, the worst that's going to happen is your client doesn't tell you the, the total truth about what their uh, prior history is, but generally the prosecutor is going to have that. And if you have a decent working relationship with your prosecutor, they can share that information verbally with you, but we're not permitted to show you the lean, the law enforcement information network or the CCH criminal history. 
but we typically try to uh, go through each of those and also kind of score to see where we're at. That's how we figure out how to maybe give a cap where we say, okay, your guidelines might be 19 to 38, but we'll give you a 36 month cap. Sometimes that's what the people want to see so that they're maybe going to uh, apply for SAI boot camp type program when they get there. So they want to make sure that the judge doesn't give them 37 or 38 months, which are within the advisory guidelines. Other than that, I'm trying to think of anything else about sentencing that might be kind of interesting, but that's pretty much it. Uh, if this raises any questions for you, please let me know. You can drop them in the comments. Again, uh, if you can hit like and subscribe, apparently it, it helps me out so I can do more of these videos in the future. So thanks so much for watching and I'll see you guys next time.